Welcome to the University of Sussex. My name's Rachel Mills. I'm the Provost here at the University, and it's a delight to welcome you all here. It's fantastic to see so many people here to celebrate and commemorate the innovative and impactful science of Professor Sir Harry Croteau. And it's a pleasure to have his wife, Lady Margaret Croteau, and his son, Stephen Croteau, here today. We also welcome staff, students, local schools, alumni, Harry's former students and colleagues. We've got members of the public and many more here. And I'd particularly like to say thank you to the Mayor of Brighton and Hove, Councillor Lizzie Dean, who is here, um, for her attendance at this special event and the support of her council. It is a great honour for the University of Sussex to be awarded this chemical landmark blue plaque by the Royal Society of Chemistry to celebrate the work conducted here at Sussex by Professor Sir Harry Croto, FRS. This led to the award of the Nobel Prize and we are privileged to have both the CEO and the President of the Royal Society of Chemistry with us today and we're going to be hearing from them both shortly as well. But I'm going to start with a few words. Professor Sir Harry Croto, FRS, is one of two Nobel laureates associated with the chemistry department at the University of Sussex. In fact, I hear that our two chemistry Nobel laureates, Sir Harry and Sir John Cornforth, known to everyone as Kappa, were great friends for many years and often played tennis together. Sir Harry joined the faculty of the University of Sussex in 1967 and worked in this Chichester building for most of his academic life. He used microwave spectroscopy to study linear chains of carbon molecules suspected to exist in the dust clouds of interstellar space. It was this early work on carbon chains that ultimately led to his Nobel Prize winning discovery. Based on his long-standing interest in the astrochemistry of stars and interstellar space, in 1985, Harry teamed up with Rick Smalley and Robert Curl from Rice University in the United States to laser vaporize carbon in laboratory experiments designed to simulate these astrophysical processes. The extremely sensitive techniques used showed a strong signal that appeared to indicate they'd made an unexpected molecular species comprising of 60 carbon atoms. This discovery was amazing. Carbon was known at that time to exist as diamond or graphite, and that's certainly what I was taught when I was a student. But carbon as a small molecule required completely new thinking. And this was, a, this was where Harry drew on his artistic side, knowledge of graphic design, he proposed that C60 was made up of a mixta, mixture of pentagons and hexagons, a structure known in ancient times, now ubiquitous in footballs and in the architecture of Buckminster Fuller. But at first nobody could prove it, and indeed many were openly skeptical. The next goal was to make this new form of carbon in bulk, and just a few years later with his student Jonathan Hare, who will give a talk later, they were able to show that here at Sussex that the soot obtained when an electric arc was struck between two graphite rods contained the molecule C60. First using infrared spectroscopy and then using mass spectroscopy in the building behind us. And soon after they were able to extract C60 and larger fullerenes with a solvent to reveal beautiful colored solutions. These original samples along with many other wonderful Croto Science memorabilia, are on display in the Croto Science Room, which is open to all visitors to the university and is situated in the JMS building in the School of Life Sciences. Do please come and visit this room whilst you're here. Even then, back in the late 1980s, Harry predicted that the iron of C60 should be observable in the diffuse interstellar bands in space. And he famously said, when asked, about the scientists who didn't believe him at the end of a 1992 BBC Horizon program, he said, they are wrong. So he was absolutely delighted when John Mayer's group in Switzerland proved him correct in 2015. And it's our great pleasure to have John Mayer here to give a talk on its identification in space this afternoon. So this site for the chemical landmark plaque on the Chichester building was chosen as it is close to the lecture theatre where Sir Harry gave numerous lectures. 
and to the Chichester Laboratories where his pioneering research sparked the nanotechnology revolution, which is having pro profound implications for a diverse range of sciences, including chemistry and physics and biology, engineering and computer science. We will, we will hear more about this in the afternoon program when Harry's former PhD student, now distinguished professor of physics, chemistry, material science and engineering at Penn State University, Professor Mauricio Torones, and a close scientific colleague and friend of Harry's, Professor Eleanor Campbell, will talk about their latest research this afternoon. By all accounts, Harry was a really fun, creative and invigorating colleague at Sussex. He was a wonderful communicator and a passionate educator. Throughout his academic life, he worked relentlessly to share his passion for chemistry and bring science to a wide range of audiences. Colleagues recollect that his undergraduate lectures were so inspiring and engaging, they would often elicit a spontaneous round of applause at the end, something none of the rest of us have probably experienced. In 1994, Harry set up the Vega Science Trust, providing an independent broadcast and archive of famous scientists describing their work. Later, inspired by what Harry called the Goo You Wiki World, that's Google, YouTube, and Wikipedia, he set up GeoSet, Global Education Outreach for Science, Engineering, Technology. The GeoSet philosophy was to provide outstanding teaching material readily downloadable by free via the internet, particularly for teachers, with the material located on the websites of participating academic institutions, the Geoset nodes. And if you Google Sussex Geoset, you will find our Geoset web pages. Harry devoted much of his time and energy visiting schools, giving public lectures and workshops, which often involved building models of his famous buckyball. This engaged children of all ages in science, all around the world. He believed in the young and was an ardent promoter of careers in science. He often attended these events with his former students, Jonathan Hare and Dr. Steve Aqua. And in fact, continuing Harry's legacy this morning, 200 year seven and year eight students and some sixth formers attended a buckyball workshop led by Dr. Jonathan Hare and Dr. Steve Aqua. And we'll be hearing a little more from them Jonathan in particular this afternoon and about Croto's carbon revolution. And additionally this afternoon, the winner of the annual Life Sciences Croto Award for Public Engagement will be announced and that prize will be presented by Lady Croto. So to finish, Sussex has never been a bland university. We have always celebrated our radical roots here, our distinctive perspective on the world and our passion for education and the lasting effect this has on our staff and our students. And Harry was an integral part of de developing that legacy. I really hope that you enjoy celebrating the life and work of Professor Sir Harry Croto today. And it's symbolized by this chemistry landmark blue plaque soon to be unveiled. This afternoon, we're gonna have all these Croto-inspired science talks. And I'd like to thank you all for coming along to celebrate this special event. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Tom Welton, who is the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He's also a Sussex alumnus, and he's going to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's with great pleasure. That's what we say at these events, isn't it? And so often, we don't mean it. But... Really, today, it is a great pleasure for me to be here, to be able to come and celebrate Harry in this kind of way. Partly because I think it's our fourth attempt to <laughs> find a date, but also it's fantastic seeing so many former teachers in the audience here today, and so it's a great pleasure to see you. But it's also a great pleasure to remember Harry and those times as the Buckyball's discovery was being made. And those of you that are alumni will remember the Molecular Sciences Lecture Theatre and the common room outside it where we would all sit. And there was no hierarchy. One day you might be sitting next to somebody who's a first year undergraduate and then the day after that next to the head of department. And we would all just chat away and, and share our experiences. And I can remember really clearly when the first time I heard sitting in that common room in the morning, having my cup of tea, made by the cleaners who had stopped so that they could make tea for everybody. And the, the word went round the room, it's football shaped. 
It's football shaped. And we knew that something really important was happening. And you're going to get to hear about more about that um, later today. But what I really want to remember is Harry as a teacher and the Molecular Sciences Lecture Theatre there. I can really vividly remember him pulling one of my colleagues out of the audience so he could sit her on a rotating stool and spin her round so he could demonstrate momentum to us. And she would wave her arms out and slow down. And, then, and he, would, he would explain, because he was a spectroscopist, so he was teaching spectroscopy, I should have said. And, you know, he would be explaining molecular vibrations to us, you know, performing these incredible acts of waving his arms around. And he was a truly inspiring teacher. He was everybody's favourite lecturer. Oh, sorry for those of you that... <laughs> <laughs> but he was. And the, re the reason was that... We knew that he was putting his heart and soul into those le lectures every bit as much as he was putting into his science. And it just came across as you listened to him. And we were enthralled by him. I'd also like to remember him as a tutor who would take the time when you didn't understand something to find another way of explaining it. And in my case, another way and another way, until you got it. And he never, ever, ever made you feel stupid for not understanding. He always took it as, this is a challenge for my ability to explain, not your ability to understand. So I'd like to thank him for being such a fantastic tutor. And the final memory I have of Harry is, as I was applying for research fellowships, and I had, my PhD supervisor was a young academic who was barely known at the time. And Harry came up to me one day in the common room and said, you need a reference from an FRS for these things that you're applying to. Applying to. Would you like me to do it? Thank you, Harry, because <laughs> it worked. And, and here I am standing 30 years later as president of the RSC and owing that to him. So yes, you will hear a lot about Harry today as a fantastic scientist. But what I really remember about him is what an incredibly kind person he was. So it is a really great pleasure to be here to celebrate him today. And that's all I wanted to say to you. Helen Payne, my colleague at the RSC, is now going to tell you all about the blue plaques. So thank you very much. I'm Helen Payne, I'm Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Chemistry and I too am a chemistry graduate, albeit from the University of Exeter and did my PhD there, but during my time at Exeter I had the great pleasure and privilege to be inspired by Harry because it was that time at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, when Harry's work really was having an impact and I think all of us who are of that generation will have some question in mind or some question that was answered by Harry's work and all the work that was done here at Sussex. So whether it's making the world more sustainable, more open or more equal, the wider chemical science community is really here to make the world a better place. And chemistry really is vital in every aspect of our lives, as we all know, and I'm sure we all share uh, that uh, opportunity to kind of really contribute the work that we do to make the world a better place. It makes possible the advances in health, in energy and materials that underpin a very prosperous society. And of course, the diverse community of people working in chemistry is so important. So across technical staff, across research, across teaching, manufacturing, and so many other roles, and all are highly skilled and drivers of our economy. So there's plenty of shared history and close links with the University of Sussex and the RSC, including joint campaigning um, in local and national media, especially at the time when it was so important to secure the future of chemistry here at Sussex. And also many staff at Sussex and also uh, many students at Sussex who really have given their time and voluntarily to support the RSC in work on our boards and our committees and our wider work. And of course, there has also been three Sussex chemists who have gone on to become president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Of course, one is here with me today, uh, my colleague Tom Welton, um, who absolutely has uh, had that aspiration to be president of the RSC ever since I first met Tom when I was a postgraduate student back in Exeter. And also uh, the man that we're here to honour today, Sir Harry Croteau, became president in 2002. 
So the Royal Society of Chemistry landmark plaques mark the sites where people in chemistry community really have made a significant contribution to making the world a better place. The first plaque was awarded back in 1980, and there have been nearly 70 plaques since then across the UK. And my colleagues and I are trying to remember all 70 of them, so uh, we might need to be tested later. But if you look on our website, you'll certainly see a map that highlights all 70. And this is really about celebrating a diverse community of people who really do exceptional things uh, in the world of the chemical sciences and really to celebrate their life, their work, but also celebrate the impact that they have had. And as we relaunch the scheme, so I'm very delighted that this is the first uh, plaque after our relaunch, we're very delighted that this team here at Sussex, you have uh, pulled together an extraordinary day uh, to help celebrate the life and work of Harry Croto, but also the opportunity for us to unveil the plaque behind me. So congratulations to everybody here at Sussex who's been involved in a, a fittingly and uh, inclusive wide-ranging program of events this afternoon. As I mentioned, I had the great privilege of working alongside Harry Croter when he was president of the RSC, and absolutely, he would work with all the staff at the RSC, all members of the community, irrespective of the roles that we held or the, the level that we were operating at. And I certainly remember taking a group of students uh, back in 1998 uh, to the Lindau meeting of Nobel laureates, and Harry was inspirational to the students who came with me, and absolutely those students were in awe of the work that he'd done. And I too remember uh, back in 1990 when I first met uh, Harry, when he came to Exeter to give an undergraduate lecture, I remember him taking the football out of the box uh, to explain uh, the structure of C60. And I think we were all absolutely entranced uh, by what we saw. And of course, that legacy and that uh, impact of that work carries on. So Harry inspired so many people with his vision for chemistry, but also, and importantly, his passion for outreach. And he very much was at the forefront of change, and he very much was at the forefront of change at the Royal Society of Chemistry, and we have so much to thank him for. So thank you very much, and I too am looking forward to joining all of you this afternoon for the programme of events. So I now have the privilege of handing over to uh, Lady Croteau, who is going to say a few words. First of all, I, I want to thank on behalf of Harry and, and our son, Stephen, who's here, and David, to thank um, many, many people. So firstly, of course, the Royal Society of Chemistry. As you heard, he was the president and, and had a very um, good relationship, enjoyable time with them, and they've also been very kind to me. As it continues, the relationship continues. And the University of Sussex, of course, for putting on this event and I believe probably nominating him for this plaque. And also the city of Brighton and Hove for giving their permission for this plaque to be put on a listed building. I had no idea before that it was a listed building, but it is. And it's very appropriate because it's the building in the university that Harry loved the most. He spent more than 37 years of his life here and much of the work, the research was done in this building behind me. So it is very, very fitting. Um, but I know that he would have wanted to say, this is a celebration of C6, carbon 60, which he named Buckminster Fuller in after the American architect um, because we'd been at Expo 67 and he had admired particularly the Expo was that structure. And it was that structure that gave a clue to the structure of carbon 60. So all sorts of ways where inspiration comes from. And especially for Harry because art and architecture were, and graphics were his main in, uh, major interest else apart from science. Um, so I know that he would have wanted to say this isn't just a celebration of this molecule, it's also a celebration of science, of teamwork and of international collaboration. And he would want to thank, he would have wanted to say I know he didn't do it all by himself, he couldn't have done it all by himself and there are many, many people that he would want to thank. Going right back to his student days, at the University of Sheffield, um, where Richard Dixon was his supervisor and suggested he went on to the National Research in Canada, which, where we had a wonderful time, and where some of the future collaborations were that was even involved in this discovery that he did back with people he'd met in Ottawa. And then it was John Murrell, who you all know, who was a very important figure here for many, many years and dean of the school. It was John who lured Harry back here and it was John who gave him support, encouragement, and friendship over the whole time. And I know that he appreciated that. John gave him support without pressure. He didn't need pressure. He put that on himself. 
and he really appreciated that. And then his closest um, collaborator and friend here, David Walton, who did much of many of the early experiments um, in this building. So I'm very happy that Alison Dixon, Shirley Murrell, and Carol Walton are all able to be here today. And then I go on to the students, because there are many of those over 37 years. And the, those that did the workshop this morning, Steve, Aqua, and Jonathan, Jonathan Hare, were with Harry for more than well over 10 years, both on the research side and on the science education. And they both continue to work in, in it today. So that's really lovely to have all these friends around. And then, of course, the th third student that, that I particularly want to talk is Mauricio, who is here today and who will be talking to you this afternoon. And Jonathan will be talking to you about the um, history, really, of the buckyball, as I'm going to call it, or carbon-60. And then the other speakers this afternoon are both longtime friends and colleagues, Eleanor Campbell, who we've seen in all sorts of places all over the world, and who is now um, a professor at the University of Edinburgh, and John Mayer um, from the University of Basel. And I have a special thank you for John, because he was the person who put the icing on the cake. Um, I think you've already heard that Harry has long convinced that this molecule existed in space, but he couldn't prove it, and not everyone believed him. So I can clearly remember the day that John was able to tell him that he had proved it, and how happy Harry was that day. In fact, he said, I never thought I would live to, do, to see the day. And it actually wasn't that long before he died. Um, so, that, so thank you, John. And there has been more icing. This is more icing on the cake, of course, his plaque. <laughs> and I don't think he ever envisaged that. And I think that would have been a complete surprise to him. Um, so thank you to the Royal Society of Chemistry. And finally, the, the Croto Science Room that you heard about. Now, that was one of his dearest wishes. And it's been a while coming but I'm really pleased that it's now open to the public, and I hope you'll take your families, go and visit it. Um, the idea really is, uh, I think it's fitting with the plaque that you haven't yet seen, um, because the plaque tells you about but this is the, what the discovery is, but it doesn't explain anything. So going over to the room, if you want to know, if people want to know more about what this was all about, that will all be there in both pictorial and audiovisual form. So I don't know whether you'll have to time today, but I hope you'll visit it at some time. Um, and so for that, I particularly, I obviously want to thank the University of Sussex for providing the room. I and mean, special thanks to Hazel Cox, professor in chemistry, who worked so hard over the time in setting up, and to Jonathan Hare, who's done so much in every field imaginable, and also to our son Stephen for all his suggestions and help. So I thank you very much for coming, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.